I'll start by giving you a little bit of background about this, uh, about these ayahs. See, this, uh, this surah was revealed as one of the first surahs to the Prophet And it was actually this one that was calling him to start to preach. It was telling him that it's time to get out and tell the world about what was being revealed to him. So in many ways, this is the surah that was calling him to become a da'i. And so I think it's very important as people who are in this field, who are trying to be active, who consider themselves um, people who are da'is, to, to hear how the Prophet ﷺ was called to this mission. So this is, this is my reading, not a tafsir, I'm not qualified to do that. But this is how, these are my reflections and my readings from my life experience on, on this message. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Ya ayyuhal muddathir. So the surah starts out calling the Prophet ﷺ, Ya ayyuhal muddathir, which means you who is covered up, you who is unfolded. And, and this is a really important point because the first reaction that the Prophet had to being called was to, was to hide from it, was to, be, to seek cover from it, was not to run to it, but to, in fact, run away from it, was to have fear of it, because he understood the gravity and the responsibility of this call. And that is exactly where we should always start in this pathway to activism, with reluctance, not with energetic zeal running to it, because it is a hard road to walk. It is not fun, it's not glamorous, and if you're doing it for the right reasons, you will see very quickly that you will have so many obstacles and very little glory there are small moments where you might feel like you've done something that gives you some satisfaction, but those are far, those are few and far in between. And this is from personal experience. So if you are not starting this path with incredible reluctance, then you have to check your intentions. Because if this is for any other reason than a reluctant acceptance of responsibility, then I would advise you not to take this path. قُمْ فَأَنذِرُ Rise and warn. And this is really the second important message. He was asked to rise and warn, not rise and convert, not rise and bring about results. His, the message he got was to rise and warn. And that's how we have to think of ourselves, as warners or as messengers and not missionaries. Our role in whatever field we're in is obedience and delivery of a message, not outcomes. And this, is, this should really help us relax. It's actually perhaps the balance of the first uh, message, which is you should go to this with reluctance. The second thing is, it's really not up to you to bring about results. No one will hold you accountable. I mean, maybe people around you, but when you stand before Allah, what you will be asked about is, were you obedient to Allah? Did you have the right intentions? And did you give it your best effort? But you will never be asked about the outcomes. So ask yourself when you're in this work about your obedience, not about the outcomes. And this is incredibly important because as soon as you attach your heart to the outcomes, you will fall into all the traps of shaitan. This is exactly what he wants you to do. Because when you take the outcomes as your responsibility, you will resort to a mentality of the end justifies the means. And I've seen it every time. Don't take the outcomes as your 
role because they're not. Whatever happens as a result of your effort was not because of you. And whatever didn't happen, even though you worked your hardest, is not on you to blame. Divorce yourself of the outcomes. Be a warner. Be a mailman, not a missionary. You will be asked, did you deliver, not did the person open the letter and read it and understand it and believe it. That's not your role. Your role is only to have effort and intention. And this really goes along with this same idea. Glorify your Lord. You have to be in this work because of the glory of Allah. Not for your own glory, and then I'm going to add, not for the glory of your group, your organization, your movement. It's fine to be organized and work in a group. There's nothing wrong with that. It's fine to be a part of a movement. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. But don't lose sight of why you're working. It's to glorify Allah, not to glorify any brand. Your brand, your group's brand, your movement's brand. And again, as soon as people lose sight of this, you have Muslims competing with each other for something they should be cooperating toward. When, when I see a community, for example, with three different Muslim organizations going after the same group of people, trying to get them to go to a different mosque during Ramadan for Qiyam al-Layl, this is when you really realize that the brand has overtaken the mission. If people are praying Qiyam al-Layl in a masjid, let them pray it in that masjid and go after the people who aren't praying. It's not one zero-sum game. When we're competing over the same worshipers, we're losing sight of the point. There's so much work to be done that when we start competing with other Muslim organizations trying to do exactly the same thing, then we're putting our brand before the mission. We're not glorifying God. We're not doing the work for the right reasons. Don't compete for the same goal, cooperate for the same goal. And the way we do that is to never lose sight of the fact that we are trying to glorify God, not our own brand, not our own organization, and not ourselves. Now, this has a lot of different meanings. One, wow, already five minutes left. Does speed through. One is purify your clothing, or, or literally your garment. But another is your inner self. Purify your heart. I'm going to go with the second meaning because it's so essential in this work. You have to do the hard work of your daily purification. Don't leave the house without your morning dhikr. Don't let the afternoon pass without your afternoon dhikr. This is beyond, of course, <clears throat> to protect your prayers. If you're in the work of public service or da'wah or activism, your inside has to be pure, and, it has, and, and your work has to come from a daily diet of purification. Otherwise, the work will be done for the wrong reasons. If you're not making fajr, then, any, then, then that's what you have to work on, and, and the activism has to take a back seat. And this is talking specifically about Ruj, which was a, the name of an idol in, um, in, uh, during Jahiliyyah. And it, it's telling you to shun this idol. Um, the reading, uh, there's lots of different um, tafsir of this, but essentially what it's saying is shun false idols. Remove them from your heart. And it's not that any of us are, you know, making sujood to an idol, but the idols of today are our ego, are the desire for fame, are the desire for reputation. Constantly check your intentions. Constantly think about, why am I doing this? And consistently remove those idols as as they appear. And the thing is about these, these, uh, these 
shadows that, that creep into the heart is they're very quiet and very gradual. And so it's not, it's not enough to do it the first time or when you begin. It has to be a consistent effort to take them out of your heart and out of your intentions. And this means do not give so that you may receive. Don't do things for self-interest. Don't, don't volunteer because it's going to give you something back. Always check your intentions. Always think about doing what you're doing for Allah's pleasure alone. And then finally, the, the final um, message in this, in this uh, tafsir. وَلِرَبِّكَ فَاصْبِرْ And to your Lord, be patient. To your Lord, to your sustainer, turn in patience. Now there are two things I want you to take away from this one ayah. First, the, the word used for Allah in this ayah was your sustainer. The one who is taking care of you. And this is very important because when you're doing this work, you will be tried. You will be tested in, in so many ways that you didn't imagine. And it has to be a law that you go to for sustenance. There really is no other way. It, you can have a group of supportive friends, and that's great, but they have to be secondary to a law as your sustainer without putting a law in the middle of this as the source of sustenance, you just won't last. You will be burned out, or you will start to do it for the wrong reasons. And then you need patience. You need patience because inevitably you will be uh, up against some serious obstacles. And the one that I want to talk about, and the one that I always mention, is among many other things, you will face slander. Slander is almost inevitable if you have a public role. Now, how should you deal with slander as one of the many things that will come up? The first thing is feel some rest in your heart that you are joining the ranks of the greatest people in history because every single prophet faced slander without exception. Every single person calling to the way of Allah or working for justice faced slander. So you're among the, the, the greatest and the best people in history. The second thing is be grateful for it. And one reason to be grateful for it is it's taking away sins. But a second reason to be grateful for the slander is it's creating friction between you and the love of the fame that you have. So when you become a public figure or when you are active in your MSA or, or in, your, uh, in your community, you will be known. And some of that will be positive and some of that you might even start to enjoy. The, the praise that you might get, the notoriety you might get, the, the fame you might get, and you might start to enjoy it too much. But the slander is great because it creates a friction between you and attachment to that fame. You start to not like it. You start to wish it wouldn't be there. And that's exactly as it should be. So be grateful for the slander because it creates that friction to prevent you from being attached to it. The third reason, the third way to deal with slander is to think about what others have to go through for speaking a word of truth. If we have to deal with trolls on Twitter, they're facing tear gas and tanks. So there's a humility that we have to take in and be grateful that the slander that we're dealing with is far less in, in, um, in seriousness. It's not a threat to our life. We can turn it off. It is possible to simply uh, 
turn off your phone and go to sleep and be safe with your family in most of our cases, while others around the world pay a much higher price for speaking out. Thank you.